Hi everyone, uh, thanks Eve um, for having me. As um, Eve said, I was really pleased to speak uh, in Sheffield when um, we had a really big group of people uh, come to Sheffield Town Hall to talk about getting into politics. It was a really lively um, discussion. And um, what is fabulous is to see so many sisters coming together to support each other and to think about how we can be more involved in politics. I'm really pleased that the Parliamentary Labour Party is now over 40% um, women. And we've done a really, really big push on um, making sure that we get women candidates in our um, target seats for the next general election as well. So hopeful that we can be over 50% um, in the next, um, after the next general election. In Sheffield, it's also brilliant that we've got um, a female leader of the council, which is really quite rare across the country, and more than a 50% um, gender balanced um, cabinet in our, in our council. So um, there's some great role models out there already, um, but I think organisations like this are really important to encourage more activity and to break down the barriers because one of the most the, one of the questions I get most often is how did you become an MP and how do I become um, an MP and it's not always the easiest answer uh, to give because there is no set route in at all and if you had 10 MPs of us here and I'm sure Shay will give her own very different experiences to how she became involved in the council each one of us will give you a completely different um, experience but I, I Having said that, I will still tell you mine, <laughs> um, which is that I was involved. I've been involved in the Labour Party since I was 15 years old. I was a weird teenager um, and uh, got active. Um, you know, was out there knocking doors, delivering leaflets. Not so much going on to my branch meetings and my constituency meetings. And quite frankly, from particularly speaking to other women, those that have done that have been more put off um, than uh, than decided to get more involved. But I was really involved in. Um, in, in, in going to more debates and public meetings and things like that rather than the typical structures of the party. Um, I just remained active. I got involved in my trade union, um, but it never really, to be honest, crossed my mind at all to um, become an MP, not least because I was living down in London after university and I never thought I would ever want to represent anywhere other, if I did, than, than my home city, which is Sheffield. And I didn't think an opportunity like that would ever arise. Um, but it just so happened that it, that it did, that my predecessor, Meg, retired quite unexpectedly. Um, and normally, um, as I'm sure you're all quite aware, when people are looking to retire or people think someone really might be step stepping down, there's a lot of people lining up mostly men often, uh, to, take their, um, to take their place. And there's already a kind of proxy competition going on before they've even stood down. But because Meg did so unexpectedly, they then made it an all women shortlist. Um, and I happened to be back living in Sheffield at the time. Um, so I was really encouraged by my trade union, Unite, to stand um, for selection. Um, and it was, you know, it, the, the, the selection battle was, um, was one of the, one of the toughest things I've, I've done actually, because you go from representing your party and I was very used to being out there on the doorstep telling people why they should, for me, vote Labour. Um, and very well versed in that. You go from that to then saying why you should vote for me personally and why I'm so much better than all these other, um, in, that, in that case, only women candidates, which is a very, very different thing um, and very hard to get your head around. Um, and because I've gone from a place of not thinking about standing at all um, to then having a seven week um, selection contest, it was, I have to say, and this is another big problem in politics, a very full on seven weeks. And I was very lucky that I had an employer that was quite supportive of me. So I was able to dedicate almost full time to it. But that is a huge issue um, in all our parties that you, it takes so much time um, and indeed money to be able to stand in, in selection. That's something that we need to definitely break down. Um, uh, but I was given, you know, I was given a lot of support, as I say, by my trade union, and I, I, quite frankly, I couldn't have done it without without them. So, um, I, I believe the selection processes are a lot shorter now. Um, that it's not the barriers aren't quite as high as they were four years ago, but there are definitely still some uh, things to break down. Which obviously, any barrier always makes it harder for women and people from underrepresented backgrounds to to get involved. Um, so. I, uh, yeah, I was selected in, uh, in 2014 to be Labour's candidate, elected in 2015. Since then, I've held three different shadow ministerial posts. We've been through two leadership contests. We've had the Brexit referendum. You know, it's been a pretty busy three years to be a new MP, and it's been a very, very steep 
learning curve. Um, I was put on our shadow front bench um, only four months after being first elected um, and obviously in quite tumultuous times um, in the Labour Party. Um, and that kind of cast me into um, the, a, a bit more into the sort of like front into the limelight and not, not quite the right word but you know what I mean um, a lot earlier on than perhaps would have happened I did question time very early on after being elected and that of course then exposes you to a much wider social media audience which comes with all its positives and its um, negatives which I know is is a big part of the conversation today um the drawbacks to the social media are very well known and the media is quite ghoulish about reporting on when we get um, abuse or threats or anything like that. Um, the, neg the, the drawback of that is of course whenever I have talked about harassment or abuse and then it gets covered I end up getting loads more on social media so it kind of has a, a rolling um, stone effect in that people see that you've had um, horrible things and they decide they'd quite like to get in on the action as well. And um, you know the lowest point was uh, when I took part in a debate um, we about when we prescribed a group called National Action. It was the first time that the UK government had prescribed a listed as a terrorist organisation, a far-right group in this country, a domestic far-right group. It's mostly Yorkshire-based and it did have links um, with Thomas Mayer, who was Joe Cox's killer. And I took part in a debate um, about that and I said, you know, we do have to, um, we do have to think very carefully, this is exactly the right thing to do, and we do have to think very carefully about domestic extremism. And I worry about Britain First, who are a group that stand in elections, but they also give their supporters uh, paramilitary training, they equip them with knives, um, and they distribute, you know, Nazi propaganda. Um, and uh, I, I talked about some of the death threats that I'd had from Britain First supporters during the referendum and because then the Sunday t the times ran that the next day then I got a whole load more death threats from uh, from Britain first um, members and that obviously brings you know that's horrible horrible for me it's horrible for my partner who has to see it and I've had to ban him from piling on on Twitter and defending me because he was doing that he was getting in sort of rows with um, rows with all sorts on Twitter it's really really hard for my staff um, to deal with because they have they filter a lot of it for me and they see that they're they're the first sort of line of defense of everything that comes in and it comes in through really surprising ways so some of the worst threats I've had have been um, on comments on YouTube um, rather than on Twitter I have to say I now filter my Twitter very very highly I don't see any you can Twitter is very good at that now you can filter it so you don't see any posts from anonymous people or people who haven't confirmed their email address or their um, or their picture so that does stop you know the real trolls and bots and things like that um, but you know as I say that is all well documented I have to say there's also a lot of love on social media you know particularly from other women and I get that you know, a lot from my constituents I get a lot of really nice um, feedback that you wouldn't get otherwise so it's definitely you know I have thought about it on several occasions about coming off um, particularly Twitter because there is you know there is a lot, a lot of hatred on there but it is well balanced out more than balanced out I would say um, by the support and by the obvious reach that you can get with your constituents and I would say now obviously it sort of goes without saying but MPs are so much more accessible and we're able to have so much more reach and feedback from our constituents um, than ever in the past you know I had a good example this morning the local NHS were proposing to close down two GP surgeries in one bit of my constituency and I was able to put that out on Facebook you know promote it all in that area and immediately get hundreds and hundreds of comments back that traditionally would have taken me you know weeks if not months to be able to to get back and would have taken a lot more hard work and time that you just don't necessarily have in this role so it helps me do my job immeasurably um, than it ever has in the past and it helps constituents see and uh, and have more trust in what we're doing because a lot so much of the time we get asked you know what on earth do you get up to during your day and it actually enables you to you know we can now live stream our debates on Facebook just post about the meetings that we're having they, they get to see what we're doing with our time and what effect it's having there's one guy that's posted a couple of times on my Facebook he said uh, you're gonna have to stop destroying my 
um, my image of MPs, you know, please start fiddling some expenses or something like that. So it is, you know, it is help generating that trust. So, you know, I would very much say um, it, it is more positive than negative. Um, it is hard. Of course, it's hard when you get... Um, when you get messages and abuse like that. I would say from a personal perspective, the hardest time was when um, it comes from your own side. Um, and my the hardest experiences I've been through is when other Labour supporters and members were um, have, have been abusive and have, have sort of attacked me. Um, but I think the best way to combat that is to always conduct yourself um, as positively and as constructively and as um, you know humanely as possible. Um, and that's what I try to do always on, on social media and it does then generate better better behavior but that's certainly been the hardest but you do you know you do you do develop you do have to I'm afraid you know there's no way around it you do have to develop a thick skin um, and your skin only gets thicker in this business the line to tread and the, the most important line to tread is that it doesn't get too thick and you lose sort of that empathy and the connection with people and that's something I think I always try to bear in mind but it is it is a difficult line to tread um, and, to, and to balance in uh, in this business um, I think I've done about 10 minutes Eve so I'll leave I'll leave that there and then hopefully get some more out in questions Great, thank you, Louise. Great, and then it's always good to hear that yeah, there's more positive than there is negative.